Thank you all for coming to uh, this year's lecture, Global Gitovich Lecture, uh, on behalf of the program on Ethics, Policy, and Economics. I, I welcome you. I'm uh, Nicolas Sabani, the director of the program. The lecture series was established by Ms. Kirti uh, Litovitz and her daughter, Lori, in memory of the son, uh, Robert, who was a student here in the Divinity School, in a Columbia Law School. Uh, Robert was a very talented person committed to social justice. And uh, the Litovitz has established this lecture with a focus on ethics and social policy, and a special focus on religion. And this year, we're lucky to have <coughs> uh, Joost Hilterman from the International Crisis Group. Joost has uh, studied the Middle East for many years. He was a Human Rights Watch and director of the Young's Project there for uh, 10 years, about 10 years, and previously to his position now as Chief Operating Officer at uh, ICG. He was the director of the Middle East and North Africa Division, uh, Deputy Director of the Middle East and North Africa Division at ICG for five years. He's written two books. Uh, on the Middle East, one on Iraq uh, uh, and America's role in the uh, conflict uh, with the Kurds and the Halabja massacre, and another on the Intifada, labor uh, union and women, women's movements there. He has written extensively in the New York Review of Books, Financial Times, National Interest, and several other publications. And today he will talk to us about the evolution of the sectarian conflict in the Middle East, not just in Iraq, but in other countries in the region as well. Thank you. And after the lecture, you're all invited to a reception upstairs. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Nicholas. Uh, in case you wonder how he settled on me as a speaker, it's very easy. It's nepotism. Um, we're old friends. And um, uh, his wife and I used to work. Uh, we're colleagues in the same organization. And uh, I've known Nicholas uh, now for probably 20 years or so. Um, so it's very pleased to see him after actually a number of years because I've been outside the country and, uh, and to, be, uh, to be able to, uh, to give this presentation to you. And I hope uh, it will help uh, enlighten you a little bit. And I hope it's not too basic. I'm, uh, I'm going to have to say some basic things and then um, tell you a little bit about uh, our experience in, in the Middle East, um, witnessing these, these uh, past events and trying to interpret uh, what has happened, in, especially um, with regard to uh, to the phenomenon of, uh, of sectarianism. Just first want to say, uh, to the extent that you don't know, uh, the organization that I've been working for for the last 10 years, the International Crisis Group, it's an, a non-governmental organization, uh, not-for-profit, uh, worldwide, active in areas of armed conflict. It's a conflict prevention organization. Um, so, But we do research, mostly. Uh, and write reports, mostly. Um, that's our way of trying to prevent conflict. Um, it's a, it's a, a limited attempt, but, um, but it's one that uh, is, has been proven to be needed because um, uh, what, what uh, our founders discovered was is that in areas of armed conflict, there is a dearth of independent information and analysis. Um, uh, usually, uh, there, there's intelligence agencies that are feeding into their respective governments, but there are no independent actors that can do sustained analysis about the drivers of conflict and how conflicts evolve and how they can be brought to an end or how they can be pre prevented or how a post-war situation can be prevented from sliding back into active armed conflict. So that, that's our work and, and our value added because any number of organizations, institutions can write uh, intelligently about conflict and how it should be ended, but our value added is that we are based in the field, <coughs> on the ground, in areas of armed conflict, and we talk to all actors, uh, the full spectrum of actors in a conflict without any particular bias toward any one of them. So in other words, we take all views seriously and see them as, as legitimate, and we represent them in our analysis fairly, uh, even if we end up diverging in terms of our recommendations as to where a conflict should go. Um, so that's, that's, um, that's our work. So in that, as part of that work, I was uh, working um, mostly in Iraq in the last 10 years, on and off. I mean, I didn't live there, it was, it was through visits. Um, but most of my work was there. I've also done work in Yemen and in Bahrain in the last few years. So based on that, those experiences, I want to now give you a, uh, an overview of the phenomenon of, of sectarianism and try to explain uh, how 
not how it occurred, because it's been there all along, but how it uh, was uh, accelerated uh, in the last, uh, well, in the last two years for sure, but even before, since I would argue, since the Iranian revolution. Um, and to maybe suggest some ways of, uh, of, of, you know, trying to overcome it or at least um, um, remove its worst aspects. It's important to define sectarianism. Um, I offer the definition that it is a form of bigotry, bigotry um, that um, involves the, uh, the accentuation and manipulation of religious difference for political ends. Religious difference usually between denominations of the same larger religion. So within Islam would be between, for example, Sunni and Shia, um, within Christianity between Catholics and Protestants, or, or any other uh, sections of these religions. So um, if we accept that uh, definition, the question is, how, can sectar how is sectarianism successful? And can it be prevalent at times? Because religious difference is there all along. Whenever uh, a, a, a group splits off from a dominant group, you end up with difference between these groups. But that doesn't necessarily lead to open conflict. So when does that happen and why? And I would argue that this is particularly likely in times of great insecurity, of armed conflict, violence, chaos, collapse of state institutions, um, great uncertainty to people um, who seek recourse in um, subnational identities, identities below that presented by the state apparatus um, in the absence of that state apparatus, uh, sub-identities that provide some kind of protection because they are championed by political actors that have the resources to provide protection. It's like the mafia, um, but it's not necessarily a bad actor. It can be a good actor. It can be uh, an actor that seeks to protect uh, the group. But by protecting it, or by seeking to protect it, it also uh, accentuates these, this, ident this specific identity, which is usually an identity opposed to another one. Now, I would argue that in the modern Middle East, sectarianism, even though it has existed all along because religious difference has existed and it has been manipulated in the past, the upsurge we've seen is a fairly recent phenomenon. And I go back again to the Iranian Revolution. Um, the Iranian Revolution is when it started, but I would say that the Arab Awakening, also called the Arab Spring, um, really brought it out um, because what the Arab Spring did was to, through popular protest and po popular mobilization, popular action, is to remove these state structures in a number of countries. Um, but we'll come I'll come back to that in a, in a minute. When these state structures had, had prevented these, the states, depending on which one, you can look at, at different ones, they either used sectarianism politically for their own ends, but they managed to contain the fallout from this because they actually had a functioning state structure. Um, but otherwise, they managed to, to, to keep sectarianism at bay, essentially, because groups, in the end, their contests, their internal contests, were arbitrated and mediated by the state structures. Um, so they were not allowed to erupt in full. But when you remove the state structure, you know, all hell breaks loose, basically. You know, you take the, the lid of the pressure cooker and all these countervailing claims come to the fore. And that's when sectarianism, and not only sectarianism, but also ethnic difference and other differences, political, of course, also come to the fore with everybody claiming uh, space and seeking to, to gain control, uh, to certainly to, to reassert control over their own fate or own lives, livelihoods, but also to gain power. Now, in, in Islam, the main sectarian difference, or the main, I say, religious difference, I should say, is, is between Sunni and Shia. There is no significant doctrinal difference between Sunni and Shia. They're both Muslims. They both, at least the mainstream Sunni and the mainstream Shia, consider themselves each other, sorry, 
as legitimate Muslims. They do not question the Islam of their co-religionists. Co you know, Shia will go to Mecca to pray at the shrine there as if they were Sunnis. They're not Sunnis, but they are Muslims, and that's acceptable to them and acceptable to the Sunnah. I think it's less common for Sunnis to go to Shia mosques to pray there, but it's absolutely legitimate and, and, and it is done. And to the extent that people are intermarried and the, the, the two sec sects are, are mixed, you will often see a cross uh, um, you know, religiosity with people going to each other's mosques. Very common in cities, in urban settings. These, these doctrinal differences are further overcome precisely because of what I said, the, the, uh, the intermarriage question, which in, in say Baghdad, the Iraqi capital, uh, is and has been very prominent, but also related to that, the secularization uh, that occurs in urban settings. Um, so again, the whatever sectarian differences, or sorry, again, religious differences, I have to be careful with my terms, and I keep tripping over them, but religious differences uh, are easily overcome when the society becomes uh, more secular. Now, I'm going to tell you three anecdotes throughout this presentation. Here's the first one. They're all three Ali versus Omar stories. Um, and the first one will be in Bahrain. But before I do that, Ali and Omar, these are names, you know, redolent with meaning in the Islamic world. Why? Because the origin of the uh, split between Sunni and Shia is not about religion, but about who is going to, was going to succeed the Prophet Muhammad. And that conflict was settled in favor of the Sunni, um, who designated one of the compatriots of the, of the Prophet as the first caliph, that was Abu Bakr, and then the second one was Omar. The fourth one was Ali. Ali was the son-in-law of the Prophet. He claimed that the uh, rightful heir of the Prophet should be one of his relatives, in fact, should be him. Um, there was uh, no, no agreement on this issue, and the two sides split off, uh, with Ali um, uh, creating a series of, ima or, or sorry, uh, 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 becoming the, the, the imam of, of, of his line of Islam, with uh, 11 to follow, the 12th one of which um, ended up disappearing and being like the Messiah, um, supposedly coming back one day. Um, and the, the Sunni side um, had a series of caliphs, which eventually ended, but until now, uh, Sunni Islam is the mainstream form of, of, of Islam. Um, and there is still talk of a return to the caliphate. Now, Ali and Omar in Bahrain. So to, to Shia, Ali is everything, and to Sunnis, Omar, among others, is everything. Um, and these names start uh, also getting special meanings when a, situa a religious difference is sectarianized, when it's manipulated. So in Bahrain, for example, a year ago, uh, when I was there, the, um, I heard from a colleague whom I met that one of the big stories was that there was an uproar at the local school and is a, uh, for, for young children where a four-year-old boy named Omar had been asked or forced by his teacher, a Shia, to kiss her feet, which is a sign of defer deference, but it goes a little bit too far. You might kiss a hand, but you would not kiss a person's feet. So it's clearly a case of humiliation if it occurred. Um, and the school launched a little investigation, but somehow the news got out and through social media, before we knew it, there was a huge stink about this uh, alleged event uh, with the, the, the teacher being threatened and the, the names of the teacher and her husband being posted on Twitter, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Shortly after that, within a few days, another story emerged of a boy called Ali, a Shia boy, who was 16 and who had been arrested by the security services and allegedly tortured as part of an attempt to bring him to, uh, to become an informer. Um, the boy was released. His parents uh, went with him to the police to lodge a complaint. Um, and instead of uh, accepting the complaint, the police accused him of, um, uh, of lying. And, um, and soon the news was again all over uh, through the newspapers and the, and the television with the story of that this boy was trying to frame uh, the police 
and that the Shia were making a lot of political hay out of this case, you know, alleging torture, in order to cover up what had happened to the little boy Omar in the other case. So the two stories became intertwined. Well, after a while it died down and um, everybody went back to work and everything was okay again. The interesting thing maybe, first of all, that it occurred. Secondly, that it was a very common occurrence. These stories are happening all the time in Bahrain today. And thirdly, that the, that the person who told me was also called Omar. But he wasn't a Sunni, he was a Shia. Which just goes to show that these names are actually meaningless. You know, they're Islamic names, but they don't actually indicate what a person is. Plus, he was totally secular. He would never, in, he would never call himself a Shia, or a Sunni for that matter. It was irrelevant to him, and in fact, it was wrong. It was abhorrent to him. Anyway, so that's my little anecdote. We'll come back to other anecdotes later, and hopefully they will help elucidate the larger point. But the point is, in part, that people in the Middle East, as anywhere in the world, are walking mosaics. Every person in him or herself integrates a lot of different, of blood, different blood and different beliefs and different affinities. Um, they are essentially very complex constructs if you care to look closely enough. So I can say I'm Dutch, um, but, and my family has been in the Netherlands for generations. Mm, that's true, but you dig a little bit deeper and it turns out that actually I'm of German stock. It's not too hard to find. My last name has double N, usually an indicator. Anyway, um, th the Dutch could have dropped an N and you would have not known. Um, it doesn't matter. And if you start digging deeper, you'll find other things. And you find that societies are in fact very heterogeneous and that with population movements over the centuries, people have become totally blended and mixed. And so all of these denominations, so like Sunni or Shia or Christian or this or that, are artificial constructs in a way. Um, back to the Middle East. So what has brought out the sectarianism that we see now is a series of events, a series of catalysts. And then the, the first one, the main one I would argue was the Iranian Revolution in 1979. I will list the four and then go back to them. The next one was the uh, uprising in southern Iraq in 1991 following the expulsion of Iraqi troops from Kuwait, which they had occupied for a number of months. The third one was the American invasion of Iraq and then what that brought in its wake. And the fourth one was the Arab awakening. So back to the Iranian revolution. Now this was a revolution in the sense that it brought to power a new regime that advocated a form of Shiism that um, uh, postulates that the, the rulers um, should be clerics in a Shia society. Ayatollah Khomei, Khamenei was, was, the, was the leader. Um, and as the revolution succeeded and brought this new regime to power, uh, there was an, uh, an aspiration to carry, uh, to carry forth the revolution to other Shia populations outside of Iran. Um, and the main Shia populations are in Iraq, which is a majority Shia population, in Lebanon, which is a, a, where the Shia are plurality, as far as we know, no census, um, Bahrain, where they are the majority of the citizens, but not the majority of the population. Why is that? Well, because the Bahraini Sunnis, have, uh, who are the regime, have imported a lot of Sunnis from other countries, from Syria, Jordan, Pakistan, and elsewhere, non-Arabs also, Pakistan and elsewhere, to, uh, into um, Bahrain to work. Um, they have not given them citizenship in most cases, but it was clearly done as a counterweight, as a counterweight to the Shia. Uh, in, Ku in Kuwait, you have a, a sizable Shia minority, and in Saudi Arabia, you have a uh, a small Shia minority, but that minority is congregated on the, on the Gulf Coast, and it so happens in the areas of where the old Saudi Arabian oil is, uh, so in a very critical strategic area. Um, so the aspiration was there to c carry forth the revolution, but it failed. Um, the Shia revolution was not successful in these other places. It did not take off. And the reason, I would argue, is, is that for these people, 
um, they did not subscribe. They were not Persians. They were Arabs. And they, I'm sorry about that. I should have turned that off. Um, they um, uh, did not subscribe to, uh, uh, sorry, they were not Persians. And secondly, they did not subscribe to the, um, the, the new ideology of the Iranian regime, which was the Vilayat al faqih the rule of the jurisprudent, the political leadership of the clerics uh, in, in uh, Shia uh, countries. So it didn't ignite. But it, what it did do, this Iranian revolution, is to trigger a response from the Sunni side, um, and a radical response in the sense that certain groups became radicalized in, in reaction. Um, and the Salafi group, which is a group, or it's not a group, but a, a community of believers in a way, a, a, a subsection of the Sunni, Sunni Islam, who uh, they hark back to the original texts, so like a bit like Antonin Scalia in the, in the American Constitution, they're originalists. And they, um, uh, so they go back to, the, to the, the Quran, the way it was written, and they want to apply the, 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 the sayings of the prophet um, uh, the way he supposedly meant them at the time. Of course, it's all a matter of interpretation, but they don't accept that particular claim. Um, and the Salafis have been around for a century or so, but um, after the Iranian Revolution, they got a lot of impetus from that, and they started organizing. And luckily for them, the Soviets invaded Afghanistan. They went there. They started fighting. They were very successful. They received American funding. Osama bin Laden was particularly you know, um, prominent there. Um, and they got a second wind. They went back to their uh, countries of, of, of origin and began organizing there. And until today, the phenomenon of Salafi jihadism is, is very, uh, very virulent, very strong. Uh, and uh, uh, and that's, uh, that's, that started all in that period. Before we get to the next catalyst, we had the Iran-Iraq war. The war, an eight-year war between Iran and Iraq, which was an, Iraq, an attempt by Saddam Hussein to uh, dam in the Iranian revolution because of his fear that his own Shia population would rise up against him. It was a majority Shia population, and there were certainly uh, real fears there. Again, even though, even though there was no real evidence that the Shia were about to rise up, but they had claims. They had felt discriminated against. They had grievances. And so, um, in fact, nobody was happy on the Saddam Hussein, but certainly the Shia or the Shia Islamists in particular were very unhappy. So there was reason to worry. Um, and the war, the Iraqi war effort was supported by the Arab regimes, Saudi Arabia, especially in the Gulf states, which were flush with oil money. They, um, uh, um, you know, paid, paid the Iraqi war effort. And it became, in effect, a war between the Shia Persians and the Arab Sunnis. And so an ethnic slash sectarian conflict between, between these two states and their majority populations. Um, and the interesting thing is probably is that it, it, it remained a, a, a conflict between two states and it, and it did not become a Shia-Sunni conflict because the Shia of Iraq, for example, during the Iran-Iraq war stayed loyal to the regime and to Iraq, I should say. Maybe not to the regime, but to Iraq. And they fought val uh, you know, valiantly on the Iraqi side in the war. That's important to remember. In, in, their, in, in a sense, their ethnic as affinity as Arabs, as Arabs prevailed over any <coughs> religious affinity they might have felt as Shia. The next catalyst, or the second catalyst, was the, uh, the southern uprising in Iraq in 1991. And what happened there was that after the defeat in Kuwait, Iraqi troops returned to Iraq and very angrily um, you know, burned portraits of Saddam Hussein and revolted against his regime. These soldiers were Sunni, Shia, Christian, anything. Um, it was not a Shia revolt. But the population in southern Iraq <coughs> is majority Shia. And uh, so by default, I would say, by, by physical presence in the south, that revolt became more sh Shiatized, maybe is the word. Um, but what added to it was that the, a, a Shia opposition group, a Shia Islamist uh, opposition group based in Tehran, being, being an Iranian proxy, entered, was allowed to enter, was pushed to enter Iraq in the south, in Basra, 
and tried to take over the revolt, to lead it. And they carried posters of their leader, Mohammed Bakr al-Hakim, uh, as, as well as Ayatollah Khomeini of Iran uh, and other Shia luminaries. And this then allowed the Iraqi regime to fight back, maybe with American help, because the Americans then decided to allow the Iraqis to fly helicopters, which allowed them to crush the revolt. And I think the fear was that the Iranians were going to bring the Iraqi regime to a fall, having failed to do so during the Iran-Iraq war. And that this was not, certainly not an Iraqi interest and also not a Western interest. Um, okay. Now we come to, the, uh, to 2003 and the American invasion uh, of Iraq. I would argue that it accelerated the sectarianism that already existed in Iraq at the time. The Saddam Hussein had used, as I said before, states sometimes used sectarianism, but had contained it. Saddam Hussein had used it. Um, he had oppressed uh, certain groups in society, maybe a little bit more than he oppressed everybody, because he did oppress everybody. And in many ways, Saddam Hussein and his regime were colorblind. Um, you know, some of his main henchmen were Shia, for example. He had Kurds also in high ranks. He was, Christ he was a Christian foreign minister, of course, Christians were no threat to him. Um, but, um, um, but he also targeted uh, Kurds and the Shia when these groups started pressing uh, their claims, which they did in, during the Iran-Iraq war because they had the opportunity to do it, um, and by siding with the Iranian enemy. Um, so the sectarianism was there. Also, it existed in the Iraqi opposition, which was based in Washington and in, other, in London and in other Western capitals. Um, this opposition was made up of Shia Islamists and Kurdish groups, um, just a couple of Sunnis um, and some secular people. And the, the position of the opposition, to the extent that they had a unified position, was that Iraq should be, become a federal uh, state once Saddam Hussein was gone, um, and that there should be three regions, a Sunni region, a Shia region, and a Kurdish region. Well, that's a very sectarian idea. Um, and so the opposition uh, in exile, I should say, not the internal opposition, held this view and was very sectarian in its outlook. But I would say that with the U.S. invasion, the, the United States became an agent of sectarianism in Iraq in two ways. One, by creating a system of government that was based on what is called in Arabic mohassas, uh, which is essentially the um, allotment of political positions by the presumed size of one's community, be it, again, a religious community or an ethnic community or some other group. Um, that was one way. And the second way, by organizing free elections, which it's hard to argue with as a principle, uh, but which in a Shia majority country was going to lead to the rise of the Shia into power. And this was the first time in modern history where the Shia would, and in fact eventually did, come to power uh, uh, in any uh, of the countries in which they are re uh, uh, present. So it was a major, a major event. The 2005 elections, January 2005, um, um, uh, brought the Shia to power. And the interesting thing about these elections and any subsequent elections in Iraq until this day is, is that all of the political parties, almost to a fault, do not represent political ideas, but represent communities. So they have absorbed the sectarian notion because all these parties were the former opposition parties in exile, um, except for one, but even that one is a sectarian group. We'll come back to that one in a second. Um, so these political parties represent communities, and they, you know, have they they adhere to sort of the what I call an either-or identity. You know, you're either this or you're that. But you're, there is no in between, and there is no sort of taking a distance from that. You know, no secular nonsense. And they engaged in zero-sum politics. So either we, you know, we we are in power, and you are not, or you are in power, and we're screwed. Um, so we have to be in power, and the only way that we can stay in power is to make sure that you never have a chance to come to power. That is, until this day in Iraq, uh, the case with these parties, even as they go through the exercise of elections. Now, 
the sectarianism in Iraq had several aspects that are important. One is that there was a, an attempt at transitional justice, but it became also a sectarian tool um, in two ways. One, uh, there was an attempt to, um, to, um, to, uh, to, well, there was not an attempt. The, the Ba'ath party was um, uh, banned and former members were judged on the basis of the positions they had taken in the Ba'ath party, not necessarily on their behavior during the regime, but on their titles and ranks. Um, which was not a very good indicator of whether they were criminals, for example. Um, but um, that was done. And this was a process called debathification, much, much like denazification after the Second World War in Germany. Uh, and the second form, and this, and this uh, was done selectively, especially later on, when um, uh, those uh, by the new order, uh, elected order, those who were Sunnis were more likely to be uh, banned and to be prevented from taking jobs than the Shia who were slowly, gradually integrated into the new order. Um, maybe not to the top positions, but uh, all the same to um, uh, but be allowed to, um, uh, to be there. And sometimes actually s quite some prominent positions. I mean, for example, the legal advisor to uh, Prime Minister Maliki today mm, was also the legal advisor to Saddam Hussein. These things happen. Um, and the second way, other than the bathification, was through the tribunal, the Iraq tribunal, which became an instrument of victor's justice. And if you remember the scenes of the lynching of Saddam Hussein, um, this was very much interpreted in sectarian ways as the Shia lynching a Sunni, rather than sort of a popular group lynching, still lynching, um, a, uh, a dictator. So all of these things became uh, meaningful uh, in, in a sectarian terms. Another aspect was, of course, the violence and the anti-Shiite animus that existed. And if you looked at the websites and the, and the rhetoric and the sermons in the mosques, you would hear on the Sunni side the reference to the Shia as rawafid, the rejectionists, the people who reject what? They reject the line of the prophet that the Sunnis had established. Uh, again, it's the dynastic struggle, the succession issue. Um, and they refer to them as Persians, uh, Pharisiin or Safavuyin, uh, Safavids. Um, so this, th and this was all, these were all epithets. There was clearly, these were ways of denigrating um, the, the opponent. From the other side, the Shia also had some choice language for Sunnis um, and, and became a very, uh, uh, you know, uh, negative uh, dynamic. And the result was violence. The violence came originally from this, from one group, Al Qaeda, Al Qaeda in Iraq, and it targeted very clearly the Shia. They, one of their favorite targets was sort of these these population groups that are very vulnerable, like pilgrims, uh, you know, going to Karbala or going to a certain shrine. It's maybe a bit like the most Boston Marathon. You know, it's very easy to target large groups of people, it's very difficult to protect these groups of people. So, and they, they went after it with a vengeance. Um, they also set off bombs in marketplaces, in buses, that in, in Shia neighborhoods, etc., cetera, et cetera. Um, And so, it, it, and then that, that was what initiated it, and then it became a cycle once after the 2005 elections when the Shia Islamist parties took control over the levers of the state, and the instruments of violence, and were able to deploy the police and the army against uh, Sunni neighborhoods. And it became equally indiscriminate, and we had a sectarian war. Now, you ask Sunni Shia, you know, they're fighting each other, how did they know who was who? And that is a very good question, and I cannot answer it. And as I said earlier, you know, that was a Shia Omar. Um, and so names, um, or um, appearance or place of residence are not very accurate indicators. In fact, they're terrible indicators. But that never stopped anyone in a sectarian conflict, believe me. Um, and you've seen in the Balkans the same, and in any of these conflicts you see that it uh, uh, doesn't matter. And of course, it is a, it's, a, it's a terrible thing in, in families where you have heavy intermarriage, because then you're actually fighting your spouse or you know, your uncle or this or that. And, and what we saw in Iraq is, is actually the breakdown of families, in, in Baghdad especially, 
as a result of, of the sectarian war that was happening. I'll tell you a second anecdote about Ali and Omar. I was living in Jordan at the time. This was uh, 2005 or so, 2006. And a lot of refugees were coming from Iraq into Jordan. And the, um, a couple of them came to our office and they, they, they were working for human rights organizations. And they, uh, they wanted to tell their story. And so the first guy, one of the guys, was, was, his name was Omar. And um, he was telling me, and he was really outraged, he says, when he came into Jordan through the airport, the Jordanian intelligence there asked him if he was Sunni or Shia. And they said, you know, um, uh, your name is o Omar. And, and, but it, not much happened because they, the Jordanians already assumed he was a Sunni, and so they let him in. But he, he was actually a Shia. He was a Shia called Omar, and he really resented the fact that he was asked a question. Of course, he didn't say anything. So he got into Jordan, all right, as a refugee. His colleague was named Ali, and you already guessed that he was a Sunni. Um, and so he got in, despite his name, for two reasons probably. One is because maybe from his family name, the Jordanians who know the tribal system in Iraq quite well uh, figured out that he was a Sunni. Or, because Ali is actually a very common name in Jordan, in fact, m members of the royal family are called Ali, and Ali is, 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 is no longer a Shia name, basically. So again, it's a very poor marker of, uh, of your background. Anyway, so both ended up in Jordan. But the fact, the, the issue is, of course, that the Jordanians were explicitly asking refugees whether they were Sunni or Shia, which is not a helpful thing um, uh, when, you're, when, it, when there's a conflict, because it, it escalates the conflict. All right, the, the collapse of Iraq, which happened after 2003, led to the fragmentation of the national Iraqi identity um, and gave rise or gave impetus to a number of the sub-national identity identities like Shiism and Sunnism and Kurds uh, as an ethnic group, uh, and then uh, the Assyrians and the Chaldeans and the Yazidis and the uh, Armenians and the this and the that, and everybody suddenly uh, was politically active. They had political parties. You, know, you only needed three people or whatever to have a political party. You know, the Christians are, are a very small group in Iraq, but that never prevented them from having a lot of political parties. The Turkmen's the same. Um, and so, and each wanting to be at the table, to be represented as a community. Um, and always downplaying their, their, the, the people closest to them, but slightly different. Um, and one of the political schemes that came out of this, or the ideas, and in fact, I, I can't say cooked up in the United States, because it wasn't, but something that, that certainly some of the politicians here lashed, latched onto, but it came out of the Iraqi opposition, was this notion of partition, partition in uh, Iraq, and having these three regions, Sunni, Shia, and Kurd. Um, and, you know, it had some traction for a while, not in Iraq, by the way, except among the Kurds, who very much liked it, and among one of the Shia Islamist parties. And, uh, um, but, you know, if, if any attempt had been made in that direction, I, the violence would have escalated enormously because of the population displacement that partition usually brings. Look at India, Pakistan. Um, and it would have replaced a very difficult but necessary debate over democracy, how do you, and pluralism, how do you make communities live together in a, a, within certain boundaries, it would re replace that debate with a re debate over boundaries, because once you establish regions, you have to establish the boundaries between them. And believe me, nobody ever agrees on where the boundaries should be, especially when you start looking at Iraq, where there's resources in the ground, oil, and, um, of course, everybody wants to maximize their territory, and they come up with all kinds of arguments why that area really belongs to them. So you don't actually mitigate conflict by these schemes, but you, might, you, you change the nature of the conflict, and you may even make it worse. Now, that said, there was also pushback in um, uh, Iraq against, um, against sectarianism, um, and that, that is very important, and I can... Um, um, I say, give a couple of examples. One was in 2004, when one of the leaders, or le the leader of, sorry, of one of the Shia Islamist groups, the, the Sadrist movement, Muqtada Sadr, um, reached out 
he's Sh so Shia, he reached out to the Sunnis in, in one province, Anbar, um, and expressed sort of solidarity going back to the notion of there is an Iraq out there. Um, it didn't last very long because in the end, everybody, nobody's fooled. The man is a sectarian Shia. Um, and in his usual rhetoric, that's very clear. Um, but he, he felt it necessary to reach across the aisle, if you, if you will, in order to increase his political standing and influence in Iraq and rise to, to leadership. So uh, the attempt failed, but it's interesting that he tried it. And he's made sub uh, subsequent uh, attempts as well. And the second example is from that political party that wanted, wanted to establish a Shia region, the Islamic Council for the, sorry, the uh, Islamic Council for the Revolution in Iraq, or whatever, Supreme Council for the Islamic Revolution in Iraq, sorry, it's now changed its name. Um, they, in the 2009 provincial elections, realizing that they had lost a lot of ground in Iraq because of the sectarianism and their poor governance, um, started to lower their sectarian rhetoric and started you know, emphasizing again sort of the nationalism of Iraqis. But it was too late for them. They had, the damage had been done and they lost miserably in those elections. Um, but it was also because the, the people in Iraq were, were coming out very clearly, and this was cl very clear in the interviews we did with people in the provinces, very clearly against sectarianism. They, they wanted no truck with it. All right, the final catalyst, and I'm going slow here, I should be speeding up, was the, the Arab awakening. Now, this was a pro-democracy movement in various countries um, that was eventually, in some countries, subverted by those in power um, by using the sectarian threat, and especially sectarian slash the Iran threat. So, um, the... The issue is here that while there is only a small Sunni minority in, in Iran, the Arab world has a fairly significant Shia minority. And again, I said Iraq, it's a majority in, in Bahrain as well. Um, so it is a significant minority. And this minority has at times been seen as a fifth column, as essentially a foreign agent uh, allied with Iran. And so... What happened during the Arab awakening is that some of the Sunni regimes, especially Saudi Arabia and others, started to present or to represent an internal threat to their rule, a popular threat, as an external threat, meaning Iran. So these internal people are not really calling for democracy. They are trying to bring Iran here with its uh, leadership of the, of the jurisprudence. Um, so, you know, Shia rule, basically. They're trying to replace us, our regimes. Um, and this was a way to appeal to the majority Sunni public to get them to separate themselves, or those among them who are pro-democracy, to separate themselves from the Shia. This worked very well. Uh, in Bahrain, the first instance, um, people had gathered at the beginning of the Arab Spring, Arab Awakening, around, uh, around the Pearl Monument in Pearl Square which was a national monument because pearl fishing was, is, is, is you know, what, what Bahrainis used to do. Um, and um, so it was an, a potent symbol of nationalism. And people came there to protest against the regime, making clear we are Bahrainis. We are against this regime. We want to reform it. Maybe some of us want to overthrow it. Uh, but in any case, uh, that, that it's a political issue. Um, soon the regime managed to separate the Sunni element, most of it anyway, in the, protest, uh, in the protesters away from, uh, from, 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 the, from the Pearl Square and moved them to another place called Fatah Mosque. Now, Fatah Mosque, Fatah means the conqueror. It could be the prophet, but it, in this case, um, it was um, the Khalifa family who had conquered the island three centuries ago um, and had named this mosque after them. And so suddenly the conflict took on a sectarian overtone. And, and, and the protesters were crushed. There was a Saudi interve military intervention, um, the, and the Bahraini police then cracked down on the, on the protesters. And then, only then, suddenly you heard this about the Iran threat. And suddenly, after a month, the protesters were uh, called Iranian agents. Um, but during the protests, this never came up. 
So it was clearly manipulated. What has happened in the region is that Saudi Arabia has ignited a new, out of fear of what happened in Egypt and that it might happen in Saudi Arabia and starting in Bahrain, uh, it's a Achilles heel. Uh, Saudi Arabia ignited a new round in what has been a cold war between Iran and Saudi Arabia since the Iranian revolution, using religious difference as a foreign policy tool. It's part of a balance of power game. Now what's at stake? At stake is the loyalty of the, uh, the fence sitters or the weak, the weak in-betweens. So Bahrain was one of them, and there Saudi Arabia succeeded. The loyalty of Bahrain was secured. The Shia were put back in the box for now. Not very well, by the way. Um, but the argument that, that the Bahraini Shia were foreign agents or Iran in agents is, is a strange one because if you look at neighboring Kuwait, the minority Shia there are actually pro-regime. They're not pro-Iran, so they couldn't be possibly accused of being pro-Iran. It's just that the power balance is different in Kuwait, so the Shia, who are not very different from the Shia in Bahrain or in Saudi Arabia, are their pro-regime, and so everybody's a Sunni regime and everybody's happy. So the argument is clearly, the logic is lacking, but um, it's still, as a, as a rhetorical argument, it resonates uh, with the public. Um, the loyalty of Bahrain, the loyalty of Hamas as a Palestinian resistance movement, um, it's a Sunni movement, it's a branch, if such exists, of the Muslim Brotherhood. In, before the Arab awakening, um, Hamas was receiving Iranian funding. It was quite open about it. Um, it doesn't mean that it was pro-Iranian. It, it took the money and said, thank you very much. We can use that. And the Iranians, of course, had their own thoughts about it. Um, it got so bad that Fatah, the, the more secular um, Palestinian movement of Yasser Arafat, started referring to Hamas as Shia, which of course they're not, they're, they're Sunni, but uh, they're very Sunni in fact. Um, but you know, it was, a, it was, a, was a, a way of attacking them rhetorically. Um, so, um, and another example um, of Hamas in Jordan in 2005, just ahead of the Iraqi elections that brought the Shia to power, the king was talking about a Shia crescent, crescent throughout the region and people were thinking, Shia Crescent, okay, well, Iraq, maybe, there's Shia, and maybe some other places, but what is he talking about? He, what he was talking about was Jordan, but there are no Shia in Jordan, uh, maybe one or two, some refugees for sure, from the Saddam era, but there were no Shia. But what he was referring to was actually the Muslim Brotherhood, who are Sunni, but who were his internal threat. But he was, because they were taking Iranian money, he was associating them with the Shia threat, with the Iran threat. And again, there's a conflation of Shia with Iran. Mubarak, Hosni Mubarak, the dictator, uh, autocrat of, of Egypt, actually said that the Shia in the Arab world are Iranian proxies. He said it very explicitly at the same time in 2004, late 2004. All right. So, but Hamas, in the Arab awakening, its loyalty was lost to, the, to Iran and it was gained by the, the Sunnis because Hamas, seeing the way things were going, decided to go with the Muslim Brotherhood. And... Um, uh, because the Muslim Brotherhood came to power in Egypt, in Tunisia, in uh, Libya, even in Morocco, very strong, in Yemen, making progress. Um, and so Hamas figured out that the wave of the future is uh, to go along with our brethren, literally. And, um, and so um, they, they cut their ties with Iran and they moved their headquarters from Damascus uh, elsewhere. Okay, so at the moment we have a regional uh, uh, perception, I would say, of, of two regional sectarian alliances emerging between Saudi Arabia and its allies and Iran and its allies. And the next loyalty test will be, and it's already happening, is Syria. Syria is now the battleground. And it's a place where you have a majority Sunni population, but it's a mosaic. Syria is a mosaic, just like Iraq is a mosaic. But there's a minority regime who are Alawites, who are self-described Shia, but they're not. They're, they're sort of a distinct group of Shia. Um, that have some heterodox practices, like they follow some Christian holidays and some of them seem to believe in reincarnation, which doesn't put them sort of outside of Islam altogether, so, as do the Christian practices. So they, they're, they're not very comfortable Shia, let's say. Um, no matter. In this kind of conflict, things are black and white, and so now they are seen as Sunnis in a lot of the rhetoric, especially rhetoric coming from outside Syria, where these distinctions fade, so in Saudi Arabia, for example. So they're called Shia. And 
vice versa, a mirror image, the, the, the Alawites are being supported in the Shia world as Shia. Um, and so you see these, this, this emergence of, of these, this regional, the, or the perception of, a, of regional uh, alliances. Arab Sunnis versus Persian Shia. But just during the Iran-Iraq war, we had this now, the battleground is Syria, and it will again be Iraq and Lebanon um, after, after the situation in Syria is settled, or maybe even before that. And what the, peop what, what the Iraqi Sunnis and the Iraqi Shia are doing in this battle is to seek strategic depth. So the Sunni in Iraq are wanting Syria to be on their side, the new Syria, the new Sunni majority, Sunni dominated Syria. The Shia of Iraq uh, are, are seeking help from Iran. They are not natural allies of Iran, but when they are threatened, Iran is their uh, place of last resort and, so, and, and their area of strategic depth. Um, so that's, that's where we are today. Um, now, finally, a couple of questions I want to pose and maybe provide some answers to. How does sectarianism succeed? Again, in a situation of insecurity, need for protection, ability for political groups to manipulate and to mobilize. In, in a situation of violence and insecurity, sectarianism is fueled, but vice versa, when there is sectarianism, that in itself fuels the violence. And so it's a vicious cycle. Uh, and opposite to that, you have also the, the, the other cycle, the virtuous cycle, is that, you know, how can you get uh, sectarianism to fade or to become more latent? Again, through having peace and security, which dampens sectarianism, but, sectarian, but, uh, but at the same time, if sectarianism goes down, that also encourages uh, more peaceful solutions to existing conflicts. And so you have a virtuous circle. The question is, how do you get from the vicious circle to the virtuous circle, or how can you prevent the vicious circle in the, in the first place? I go back to the, the example of the 2009 elections in Iraq, where the people were exhausted by the sectarian conflict and exasperated by the sectarian parties and their rhetoric. Um, because they realized that, that sectarian politics only brought them grief and further violence and further instability and insecurity. And so eventually it is a combination of these factors that will exhaust the, the vicious cycle and can lead to a virtuous one. But there's a larger question of how can you put the genie back into the bottle? Um, and I don't have any easy solutions, but there are some conditions that would have to be met. One of them is... You need to have a stable and inclusive transition in Syria, political transition in Syria. Good luck. <laughs> Secondly, you need to have a regional security framework with everybody at the table. This was discussed some time ago, not recently. And again, good luck. It's not going to happen anytime soon. You need to have an active discouragement of what you would call here hate speech, uh, of sectarian rhetoric, especially in the official media. Um, where would the impetus come from? Unclear. But that's, what would, that's a condition. Um, there would have to be uh, a stepping up of, uh, and promotion of exchanges, um, be it trade, very important, uh, be it uh, tourism, um, religious tourism, pilgrimages, because especially the Shia and others also they, and, uh, uh, you know, go to other shrines, um, and studies, students and there may be other, other dimensions that you can think of. And I would say for the United States, um, it has to, would have to be, you know, act very, and, and the Western world generally, but the U.S. is particularly prominent in, these, in this area, I'd say to tread very carefully when, and to understand um, these, the sectarianism that exists and to be sensitive to religious differences between groups, to understand that not all Salafis, for example, are violent, many are not, um, and that Salafis are different from the Muslim Brotherhood, and that the Muslim Brotherhood is also not homogeneous, and there are many different factions, you know, and that the vast, vast majority of Muslims are supporting political processes. Um, these are very important things. Um, so th that kind of awareness has to exist. And I would also say the United States would have to do more to lean on the Saudi Arabia to, and, and the Gulf states, its allies, to um, bring the Syrian conflict to a political conclusion. And that again, is, that has a, a transition that is inclusive and pluralist. I leave it at that, except for one more little anecdote of an Ali and Omar. Um, a friend of mine in Iraq, his name is Samir, and 
he lived under Saddam Hussein, he was working for a company. His first son he named Ali. So his company was mostly Sunnis, turned out, or he says. And so when he named his son Ali, people were disappointed. Now in Iraq or in many Arab countries, you, name, you, 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 you have your own name, but then you become known after the birth of your first son or something even before that by that name. So you become Abu Ali, you know, father of Ali. So he, to his family and to his people around him, became Abu Ali. But at work, they refused to call him Abu Ali, and they kept calling him Samir. And then he had a daughter, and then he had another son. And that son, now he became smart, he called him Omar. And so people at work immediately said, oh, Abu Omar, I'm so happy for you, Mabruk, congratulations. Of course, you know, he was not Abu Omar, he was Abu Ali, but they called him Abu Omar. To them, he was Abu Omar. So all fine and good, he survived the Saddam era. And today, they're living in a Shia <laughs> regime, essentially. And suddenly, his son, son Omar has the wrong name. So now each time he needs to get anything done, to get a job or to get a permit or something, his father has to come along and establish his Shia credentials. That's Iraq today. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think we can open it up for questions for yours. Uh, you can take his own questions for about half an hour. Uh, and then you're welcome more to attend a lecture uh, reception. reception upstairs uh, where we can continue the conversation. Should I uh, moderate? Yes. Sorry. One, two, three. And I'll take a bunch of questions. Hi, thanks so much for speaking to me. Yeah. This is really fascinating. Sure. So the first three points that you mentioned really provided the, histori the history of, of sectarian relations in Iraq kind of leading up to the present. Um, but the, the last factor that you mentioned, the, the Arab awakening more generally, um, I'm interested to know your thoughts about how the Iraqi spring has been different from the other movements around the region, particularly when we look at the difference between the protests in Iraq from 2011 to the ones that are much more sectarian now. Do you think that that reflects uh, factors from abroad, or are these really domestic concerns? OK. As I said, I'll take three questions, and I'll come back to you. Could you just briefly comment on why you have chosen your four catalysts to have left out the Gulf War in this period? So, the Gulf War, which one? The invasion of Kuwait by Iraq and all okay. of what uh, transpired as a result of that. Which was a lot of what has come at what you commented on. Okay. And sorry, there was a third one. Was it you? Yeah, sorry. To what extent do you think the um, current US Russian sort of semi, semi uh, Cold War and Russia's alignment with Iran and maybe Shia Islam playing a role in sustaining this uh, divide? Okay. And I'll take the fourth one. Yeah, I might as well. <coughs> The assumption, the assumption is that uh, a nationalism, Arab nationalism, has to be the rival, the enemy of sectarian. Mm -hmm. Because this is the identity. We all of us speak Arab. It doesn't matter if we are Christians, Muslim, Sunni, Shia. And here, like, uh, the Arab world has the longest uh, national conflict with Israel. Mm -hmm. This is the only permanent conflict of the Arab world as permanent one. Of course, they have the occupation, occupation in Iraq and other, but as permanent, long one. And also, this is the first time in their history, that in the modern history, that they lose part of their homeland, Palestine. To which extent this conflict, Israel-Arab conflict, is the sectarianism or uh, against it? Yeah, okay. I get, I'll get you. The role that plays. Yeah, I got you. Okay. Well, I'll take him in order. I think that's, that's fine. Um, so, you know, the, the Arab Awakening or Arab Spring did not really happen in Iraq, except in Iraqi Kurdistan. Um, and the thing is, you know, the it broke out in, in January 2011, which was one month after. Maliki was reappointed as prime minister following elections that were generally free and fair. So Maliki said, hey guys, I'm not the enemy. I'm not an autocrat. I'm not like Mubarak. I'm not like uh, Zainuddin Ben Ali. Um, 
I am a democratically elected leader, and I've been in office for one month, not 30 years. So give me a chance. So the, um, give me 100 days, he said. Of course, after 100 days, nothing had changed, but uh, he has a problem. But um, at that time, he got away with that. And um, so the, the, there were not many protests. There were some uh, protests over the lack of electricity, which has been a leitmotif since 2003. Um, but by and large, you didn't see in Iraq the kinds of protests that you saw in other parts of the Arab world. Um, and, um, and so it was, it was entirely domestic. But Maliki has a problem, which is he is an autocrat, or, or he wants to be one, maybe, or he is being led to be one. I have to be very careful here because it's not entirely clear yet, and maybe we need another few years to look back and say this is what really happened. But he has a, an autocratic tendency, or he's on an autocratic tendency, let's put it that way. So, and, and he is more and more relying on his party, the, the Da'awa party, which is a Shia Islamist party, uh, which is not entirely a stranger to sectarianism, to, to promote his power base. And, um, and so others respond to it in a sectarian way. And so the protests more recently um, have been over the power struggle, but it has again, it's taken a sectarian overtone. So now the protests are in Sunni provinces, mostly. Um, but so it is actually a separate development from the, it's, it's more based on the Iraqi history, which I also outlined, and not related to the Arab awakening, I would say. Um, the Gulf War, now I did, I mean, I didn't say the Gulf War, but I did talk about the uprising in southern Iraq, which came out of the expulsion from the expulsion of the Iraqi troops from Kuwait. So that was a direct outcome of the Gulf War. Um, so in terms of the Gulf War and sectarianism, you know, the Iraqi invasion of Kuwait was not in itself a sectarian issue, it has not been sectarianized. Um, it was basically an attempt to, uh, to, to shake, uh, you know, shake down the, the bankers. And, um, the, uh, and, and the result was um, the defeat of Iraq in Kuwait, the restoration of the Kuwaiti regime, um, but the uprisings in Iraq, which were two, uh, one in the south that I mentioned, and the north, the Kurds. Um, so um, in that sense, the country um, started to take a little bit the form of that tripartite division that I mentioned, with, especially with the establishment of the uh, no-fly zones. So the Kurds in the north, the Shia and the South, but you know you have to be careful with these things. And earlier, when I mentioned these three regions, uh, Sunni, Shia, and Kurds, people sort of they take a map and they say, okay, that's Kurds. In the middle is the Sunnis, and the South is the Shia. But it's an it's an idiotic idea in Iraq because if you just put a line like that, North, well, Mosul is an Arab city. You know, they have some Kurds, the Christians, Turkmen, whatnot, but it's an Arab city. It's clearly above the line. Um, if you look at the no-fly zone, Sulmania, a Kurdish city, was south of the no-fly zone, don't ask why. It's just because it was easy to say no-fly zone, 30, 36 parallel or whatever parallel it was. Um, you know, these people don't necessarily think about protecting people. Um, the middle region of Iraq includes Baghdad, which is a majority Shia city and has significant Shia pockets north of it. Samara, no, well, Samara has not many Shia now, but... Uh, uh, Khalis and other towns uh, are Shia, um, uh, and of course has also a Sunni population, and then um, and many secular. And then the southern part is a majority Shia population, but uh, Basra always had a significant Sunni minority. And if you go from from Basra to Kuwait, uh, it's mostly Sunni. Plus the tribes to the to the to the west uh, uh, of the Tigris and Euphrates are also uh, a lot of Sunnis there. In fact. All tribes in Iraq, and say I can probably say all tribes in Iraq have both Sunni and Shia elements. There are no Shia tribes and Sunni tribes. Mm -hmm. So th these are important things. Anyway, so I think I did mention the Gulf War, but maybe not by name. Yeah. To be go back to you. Yeah. Do you, you, you had talked about the U.S. and Qatar uh, fighting the when the uh, uh, Iranian incursion into southern Iraq, right, which was pre preceded the Gulf War, did it not? The Iranian, no, no, no. Does the Iran-Iraq war, it ended in 1988. Right. In 1990, Iraq invaded Kuwait. Right. In January 1991, the uprising started when the troops returned, and then the Supreme Council was pushed across the border, or happily went across the border, and tried to, um, to uh, take over the uprising. Yeah, okay, good. 
So the question about Russia and the Cold War, yeah, it's a very important one because I'm not sure it's, it, it, it have, helps sustain sectarianism in a way, even though the Russians don't care about Sunni and Shia, I think. Um, but um, it, it, uh, it helps sustain it simply because it helps sustain, more importantly, the Syrian civil war. Um, because when it comes to, to the alliances, Russia, China, Iran, Iraq somehow uh, are on one side, and they, they say they accept a, an inclusive political process, but for them inclusive means including Bashar al-Assad. The other side, also a sort of a strange alliance, um, Turkey, uh, Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states, and the United States and the Western countries, um, they also want to say they want to inclusive political process, but without Bashar al-Assad. I think that is the breaking point and nobody can agree. Um, and so by not agreeing and by the fear that if they intervene more directly, at least for the United States and Russia, that they might get into di direct conflict, I think they help sustain the internal conflict and hope to contain it. Um, and that may or may not succeed. The longer it lasts, the less likely that they will succeed, I suppose. Um, so, and, so, and, and because it is becoming a sectarian or has become a sectarian conflict, then logically then also it's sustaining that, that sectarian nature. Um, yes, yes. But I'm not sure that plays in this case. I'm not sure. Um, I'm not the expert on this and I, I stand to be corrected, but I, I don't have the sense that that is a factor. I think for the Russians, the stake in Syria, other than sort of having some warships, being able to, you know, put anchor down, is that, um, you know, they don't want the United States to succeed in Syria. You know, they're still very angry about Libya. And they, you know, and they just don't want the United States and the Western states to, um, to determine the, the, the new order in the Middle East. So, so they're holding out and they, they want to have their imprint on it. But I think there is there's room for common ground too, because you could give the Russians room at the table, a role, this and that. I think in the end, the the killer is going to be Iran. Iran is not going to let that happen. And the problem with Iran is that it's not only a conflict about Syria, but it's really a conflict about the nuclear program. And as we know, that is pretty much stuck. So it's you know these things are all linked somehow and not moving forward, at least not in the right way. Um, okay, the question on, on the Israel-Palestine conflict. Of course, this is like the primordial conflict in the Middle East, at least since 1948, well, before. Um, and, um, um, and so it has, in a way, been overtaken by the sectarian conflict. And I'm sure that some are, you know, very happy about this. Um, but it's, it's a pity and it's a, tr it's a tragedy, really, because it's, it's, it doesn't do anything to, to resolve the Palestinian issue uh, anytime soon. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there was a sectarian dimension to the Hamas thing. I mean, it's a bit of a joke because Hamas clearly was not a Shia actor and it was a tactical alliance with Iran for political reasons. Um, you know, Iran will support anybody, whether they're Shia or not, um, if that can advance its, its strategic goals in the region. Um, so Hamas included. And Hamas, vice versa, will take support from, I'm not sure from anyone, but certainly was willing to support uh, to receive Iranian support in order to fight against Israel. So, but, um, so other than that, there is no sectarian issue there. And now with the Arab awakening, which bypassed Palestine and Lebanon and Iraq, now, um, you know, um, and the conflict has been sectarianized by the regimes that were using this in order to stay in power. And all the attention has been diverted from, from the Israel-Palestine conflict. It remains as unresolved as this one. Uh, so we, we now have a multiplication of intractable conflicts in the Middle East. I always try to ha end on a happy note. <laughs> Look, just, just simply to ask you, how much do you feel it is being influenced by the Western economic and military interests? I'll give you an example. A couple of years ago, the biggest ever single sale of armaments was delivered by U.S. $62 billion, one sale, no marketing, to Saudi Arabia, who are supposed to be non-military type of 
nation. And where <coughs> the governments go, and is that partly behind the sectarian uh, evocation all the time? That you know they must yeah. fight and <laughs> use yeah. our mm -hmm. armaments and economy. All right, thank you. And you had a question. Uh, yeah, I don't know if you mentioned uh, any. <coughs> thank you, by the way, uh, for everything. Um, uh, outlook on Egypt. Mm -hmm. uh, say the next five years. What, what's your thoughts? Uh -huh. All right. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a bit outside the, the yeah. terms of this presentation on sectarianism, but no. it's not like there isn't. Developing. Well, there's the Coptic uh, issue. Uh, Coptic. Yeah, there is. Okay, okay, fine. <laughs> Any, anyone else? Yes, please. Um, can you please com uh, comment on the recent sectarian violence in Egypt um, mm -hmm. towards the Coptic Christians okay. and whether what sort of political implications that might have? Okay. Did you, Nicholas? And then May I ask? Yeah. So it sounds like uh, towards the end of the presentation, you had a list of conditions that have mm -hmm. to be realized. Yeah. For sectarians to die down, and it sounds like they don't think they will be realized. Um, Not soon. Therefore, um, the conflict will continue until people hire over it. Mm. And by that, you probably don't mean elites, you mean just common people. And when you think about the comment that you made about uh, Sadr and how you interpreted his uh, overtures to the Sunnis in Iraq as a as a ploy mm -hmm. uh, to gain tactical advantage against other elites, but I wonder to what extent it was an ploy, and he was actually tapping on into a, a sense that there was no uh, appetite for sectarianism among the, the large, the masses in Iraq, and there was a sense in which there was a shared national identity that people were willing to embrace rather than sectarianism. Uh, and the enemy at that point was uh, the United States and not uh, the Shia, right? And there was basically room for a, for a, a common struggle. Uh, it sounds like from your presentation that this uh, the, 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 the many different conflicts in the different countries that you described may have uh, economic or other bases that are not necessarily religious, but they're taken on a religious hue that benefits certain elites, uh, but is there room for those conflicts to die out as people basically realize that it's not in their interest to, 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 be, to be manipulated by elites? And how easy is it for elites to manipulate uh, uh, people? After all, in Iraq, it took a very long time for the conflict to actually become scary. Right? It was at least a year. Of, if you call that a long time, yes. Mm -hmm. That is a very long time. We went to other countries, Yugoslavia, Mm -hmm. Escalation happened very, very quickly mm -hmm. with much lower levels mm -hmm. of violence, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, thanks. I'll do that. And, yeah. um, if I understood cor correctly, you had a prescription for what the US should do to sure. minimize the uh, yeah. uh, sectarian uh, conflict. By that, I assume you're referring to the US government? Government, yes. Yeah. No, a bit of a cold question. Do you think it's in the interest of US policy in the region for the sectarian violence or conflict to die down, or is it not? Yeah, thanks. Okay. All right, I've got a bunch. Um, yeah, I'll do another round. And, uh, okay. Um, the investor in economic and military interests. Um, well, you know, if people want to fight, they'll fight. You know, they'll go fisticuffs in the hallway. You know, you don't need weapons. Um, but weapons, you know, make it um, more easy to the resort to weapons. You know, it's like the whole gun debate in this country. Uh, you know, once you have uh, uh, access to, go, uh, to weapons, you might be more likely to resort to, to the violence um, to settle conflicts. The, um, I'm not sure. I don't know if the answer is yes or no to your, to your question. Um, you know, the Saudis, it's not like they don't have a military apparatus. They have, a, they have a very strong military apparatus. What they don't have is an industrial base. You know, the Saudis buy everything. You know, they don't build anything. So, obviously, if they need weapons, they go to the United States to buy them because they've got the money. Um, whether that fuels sectarianism, I don't think so. I mean, it, weapons may fuel conflict to some extent in some areas. Um, and so, but 
the, 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 the fact is that the conflict must be pre-existing. I don't think they, they cause conflict. That's my view, but I'm sure others would disagree. Um, Egypt, um, I, uh, my outlook, I'm not, I'm not an expert on Egypt, so what I'm going to say is, is uh, you can take for, with a grain of salt, basically. But, you know, e Egypt is going through a very important development. Um, the, the Muslim Brotherhood uh, won the elections. I don't know if it's a majority-based regime, but it certainly got, you know, the support it needed in order to, to, to uh, form a government. That's important. I think they deserve a chance to prove themselves. Um, you know, people who say that, you know, it's one man, one, never mind woman, one man, one vote, one time, you know, that this is what the Muslims want and the Muslim Brotherhood want is totally unfair because these are the same people who for 30 years put up with dictatorship or maybe didn't put up with it, but in any case, um, you know, the Muslim Brotherhood suffered as much as anybody else from the dictatorship. They should be given a chance uh, to prove themselves, both in terms of their democratic credentials and their governance skills. And it's really too early. It's a very unstable situation still. I think the Muslim Brotherhood made, or the new government has made some mistakes with the constitution, other things. But the opposition has also made mistakes and not wanting to engage in dialogue. And so, um, you know, the fault on both sides. And um, uh, it's really too early. But five years down the line, I assume that this order will still be there in some form. I don't think people are ready to throw out the Muslim Brotherhood, famous last words. I'm always terrible at predictions. They're usually wrong. Uh, so, um, I'm better, backward, <laughs> I can handle better. The, um, so, uh, but the real, the real problem in Egypt, of course, is the economic challenges. And so, the fact is, is that the Muslim Brotherhood or whatever government cannot deliver anything because of the, these huge economic challenges uh, and the employment challenges that, uh, that any regime, any government would face in Egypt. So, that, that is an inherently destabilizing factor in the, in the next five years and, and beyond. So, so I don't expect any re anything really stable to emerge anytime soon. But and you might have, you know, as we've seen in other countries, in other eras, you know, you might see a second revolution or a further uh, correction. correction. Or you might see a counter coup as well, you know, with the military being fed up and, and trying to, you know, put the lid back on somehow and just oppress violently anyone who dares to, to protest and solve economic problems that way, just keep people down. Um, you know, it's worked for a long time, could work again. So I don't know which way it'll go. As for the Copts, you know, that is, you know, also very frightening, of course, that there's the sectarian element. There's been, um, you know, a lot of violence <coughs> against yeah. Copts, a lot of uh, kidnappings for ransom of Coptic professionals uh, inside, in Cairo and outside Cairo. Um, so, you know, um, but I don't know how long that, how, how durable that is. And I think I've heard some of the Copts saying it's because they're now living under a Muslim or an Islamist regime. I think that's wrong. Um, there is no evidence in history that the Muslims would be violent against the Christians once they're in power. What I think is happening is that it's, an, it's a period in which there is no stable government that has effective control over the security apparatus. And so in that kind of situation, you see a lot of criminality and you see also uh, criminality that may be targeting the vulnerable populations, which are inevitably the minorities. So I think that that is what is going on. And so what you need, never mind who is in power in, Iraq, in Egypt, whether it's uh, the Muslim Brotherhood or a secular party or this or that, but the fact that there is a stable regime uh, that actually has control over the levers of, of or the monopoly over the means of violence, if you want. So I th I, that, that's my view on this. But uh, anyway, it is very unpleasant what is happening now. Um, Muqtada Sadr in 2004, of course, Nicholas is asking the most difficult question because it's, uh, I'm not sure which way I would go. So I'm just going to um, um, fudge it and say that all of what you said is true. And what I said also <laughs> is that Muqtada Sadr did uh, use a ploy uh, in order to uh, distinguish himself from his political rivals in the Shia community, because his main rival uh, at that time was the Supreme Council, and subsequently it became Maliki and the Dawah party, but they're Shia Islamists like him. It's not necessarily the Sunnis, it's not the Kurds. 
he's also spoken against Sunnis and against Kurds but at, ty at different times, but his main rivals for power are the ones who are most likely to have power and had power, the Supreme Council and now Maliki. Um, because Sadr eventually wants to be the one in power. And so he used it as a ploy. But he also knew very well that there's a wellspring of anti-sectarianism in Iraq, that, uh, especially in, in 2004. Then there was the sectarian conflict and then it came back. Um, and so he, he built on that, I think. Plus, he could mobilize people across the aisle fighting against the Americans. Um, because that's something that most people agreed with, Sunni and Shia in Iraq, um, because the, you know, from the Sunnis you would expect it because they threw out the Shia, so now they're out of power and the Ameri they blame the Americans. But even among Shia, and I was there, I mean, it was very obvious, you know, people were very unhappy about what the United States had brought. Yes, the fall of the regime. Thank you. Great. Why didn't you leave? Or why did you not fix the electricity? You know, they thought that the Americans with their, their power could just fix the electricity. Instead, what happened was the electricity, which was actually destroyed by a decade of sanctions, the Americans couldn't fix, fix it. Plus, the demand shot up, and so you had total collapse. And this is what got people really angry. Plus, the insecurity in the streets, because the Americans were actually underdeployed, and so they could not, you know, rein in the militias that were running rampant. And, um, and so people were very angry, and, and, and a lot of people were just ready to fight. So for Mokhtar al-Sadr, it was a, a, a smart thing to try. But in the end, you know, you're not going to fool any Sunni about Mokhtar al-Sadr. You know, he is going to be, what he's doing, everybody knew he was doing it in order to gain power as a Shia leader. And, and you know, who, who cares about the Sunnis in Anbar? So that, that's my take on that. Finally, is it a U.S. interest to um, to promote what was the quote, to promote sectarianism in um, in the region, or you know, is that a yeah a benefit net benefit? I think I could be wrong, but I, I think the United States has its strong interest in protecting Israel, protecting the the oil flow at reasonable prices. Um, so th these are important things, but otherwise it wants to keep things in balance pretty much. Because if you keep things in balance, they're predictable and you can plan, and you can do this and that. When you have unpredictability, you know, everything is up for grabs. So you don't know how you're going to come out, you know, with the winners or with the losers. You know, in Egypt, certainly that, that became an issue uh, in 2011. So I think, I think they don't have an inherent interest in sectarianism in the region to the extent that it fuels conflict, which it invariably does. So I, you know, I'm not going to say the United States government is a good thing, I mean, or a bad thing. I don't, I don't make that judgment anyway. But is, 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 you know, they're on the right side and they want to do the right thing in the Middle East and they're not promoting sectarianism. I think it's not in their interest to do it. And, um, and so, and I've seen no evidence of it anyway, you know. And in fact, it's very important, an example of this is in Bahrain. You know, given the enmity between Iran and the United States, you would think the United States would take any opportunity to say, you know, the Iranians are behind this. But in Bahrain, they have been consistently saying since the beginning of the uprising that there is not a shred of evidence that the Iranians are behind the uprising that is led by the Shia. And there's not a shred of evidence that the Shia in Bahrain are being, you know, driven by, by, by the Iranians. They've made very clear to the contrary that by not opening up the political system and allowing the Shia more voice to enfranchise them, they're driving the Shia into Iranian arms. So to the, to the American government until this day, the Arab Shia of Bahrain, and in fact the Arab Shia of Iraq, Maliki, they support them as a buffer against Iran, and they don't see them as a proxy of Iran. And I think that's correct. I mean, that's a correct analysis, and they're on the right side. Of course, it could change if Maliki, for example, is out of fear and out of further sectarianism because of the Syria conflict is driven into Iranian arms for protection, then I'm not sure if the United States would still be selling the F-16s to him, right? Because then who's going to use them? Um, and in Bahrain, the same thing might happen. But I think Bahrain is more firmly ensconced in the Sunni orbit than Iraq is. Iraq is touch and go from, from that perspective. You had a question. When I was uh, listening to Professor Sambanis' uh, question, um, uh, particularly about the manipulation by political elites, um, 
So to what extent uh, the dynamics of, of sectarian violence sort of arising in, in moments of state collapse or state weakness, to what extent is this driven by political elites manipulating symbols or ideas or identities, and to what extent is it driven by personalization of politics, so settling personal scores, and, and what's the impl in implications for sort of the recommendation you have here? Yeah, that's a good question, so I'll take now. It, it sort of goes hand in hand, but I think without the political actors actively manipulating and providing protection, people would not be taking any action on a personal level against their neighbors, for example, because they need a, a protected environment in, in, in which to do it, in which they know they are the dominant group. And you saw in the, in the sectarian war in, in Iraq from 2004, 2005, until about 2008, what happened in neighborhoods in Baghdad. Now, most neighborhoods in Baghdad are totally mixed. You know, and sometimes people say, well, that's a Sunni neighborhood, and that's a Shia neighborhood. Well, fine, but I mean Sunni majority neighborhoods and Shia majority neighborhoods. There's always other groups in these neighborhoods. There's no such thing as a pure Sunni. Anyway, because people are intermarried. It's an insane notion to begin with. So, um, but you know, you can have an area around a certain Sunni mosque that is more going to be more heavily Sunni. I accept that. And so um, the... Um, now, this is, happens in every talk I give. I, at one point, I lose my train of thought. So this moment has now arrived. Um, <laughs> the, um, what were we talking about? The personalization. Of yeah, the personalization. So um, the, um, uh, in the neighborhoods, what happened was is that certain militias who were linked to political parties that are Shiite, Islamist, or Sunni, some form, uh, that, that these that these parties would take control over certain neighborhoods or certain sections of neighborhoods. And then it's very interesting to, to see what happened in those, in, those section, in those neighborhoods. So if there was a Shia militia controlling a certain neighborhood, it would expel Sunni young men uh, and maybe families. And a lot of families were displaced in this conflict. But it might also let people stay if they were no longer a threat. So they controlled the neighborhood. So, neighbor, so even uh, after the conflict, there were a lot of neighborhoods that, that never ceased being mixed neighborhoods. Um, so it's a very interesting thing. So it's, it's, there are, the, the personalization is there, but really the key issue is, is who is in control, and you know, what's their perspective, and what is their behavior toward the, the, the enemy population, I think. <laughs>